Yeah, got it. We are live now. Um, okay, good evening. If you're uh, <laughs> watching this program, uh, Forces of Renewal uh, Democratic Dialogue live series on uh, um, democratic struggle. And I have a distinct pleasure to uh, welcome Uraldo uh, Dos Santos. Uh, he's a philosopher, historian of uh, political thought, and also teaches um, the uh, civil disobedience and social movements at uh, Pontion uh, Sorbonne, uh, one of the oldest uh, universities in the world in Paris. And he's also uh, a writer who's published uh, widely in um, you know, quite a few different uh, progressive and mainstream uh, outlets, including Washington Post, uh, Jay Corbin, and others. And he also uh, edits his own publication. And uh, today we'll talk about a, a very timely subject, um, which is the, uh, the rise of uh, far right. Uh, Professor Noam Chomsky called them like proto fascists. Uh, movements around the world from India to Burma or Myanmar to Latin America and in in the heart of uh, Europe, like places like France, Italy. Italy has a far right uh, uh, <coughs> regime since uh, the, the fall of um, Mussolini in the 1940s during the Second World War. And uh, today, um, my guest, um, philosopher and historian, Ureldo, will uh, discuss the insurrections that have uh, you know, uh, come, although not as a surprise, um, <coughs> against the democratically government, uh, elected government of uh, President Lula and uh, the ex-president Bolsonaro never conceded his defeat and uh, peddled this Trumpian lie and uh, misinformation that the election was stolen instead of election was free and fair and he was... Uh, defeated um, squarely. So without further ado, um, let me offer uh, Ureldo the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Zarni, for having me and for the opportunity to discuss what has been happening in Brazil and especially what happened last Sunday. Um, yeah, so let's just start with a very short uh, input by me and then we can discuss all the topics you have just raised, I do think that we are somehow seeing in Brazil uh, the manifestations of a broader phenomenon that has been happening across the world. So, for example, many coup the tasks and many coup attempts has been, or sorry, have been happening around the world last year in 2022, in Africa, for example, in Latin America, and Asia and so on and so forth. So not only coups, but coup of tents, as I have just said. Then we have been seeing the ways in which insurrections by far right movements have been taking shape, especially in the US. And in general, I think what's dangerous is to say that what's happening in Brazil is just one more time, the same thing happening. So I think that's not exactly true. We have been going through a very specific a political process as well that somehow made it possible for this far right movement to storm Congress, the presidential palace, and the Supreme Court, which probably starts in, I mean, we might say that starts with the Cold War, we might come back to anti-communist coup d'etat mainly triggered by the US government during the Cold War and the ways in which it played a key role in the dictatorship in Brazil. But let's say that in the shorter term, it starts with uh, the protests in Brazil in June 2013, in which for multiple reasons, uh, the far right start to take shape and to participate more intensely in, the, in public forms of demonstration against the regime. Then we have the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff uh, a few years later. Then we have 
the election of Bolsonaro, everything that happened during Bolsonaro's government, and especially perhaps in this case, the fact that Bolsonaro has insisting for a few years that the electronic voting system in Brazil, which has been always a very good reason for Brazilian people to be proud of our voting electoral system, would be rigid and that it would be necessary to come back to paper. And by doing so, Bolsonaro started to prepare the field or to create a battlefield in which he actually might say later, as I have been saying some time since he lost the elections in October 13, that 30, sorry, October 30, that he actually didn't lose the elections, that the system is problematic and so on and so forth, as he had said before. And as you say, for sure, relying as well on the rhetoric of far right movements in the US. So for sure, since the insurrection in the US in January 6, many movements in Brazil have been insisting that they would like to do the same here. They tried, or they actually say they might do so on two specific occasions. So Independence Day in Brazil is September 7, which became in the last few years, a very important date for far right movements. Bolsonaro tried to make sure, or tried to make sure that this date was very important for him to insist on how the Supreme Court and Congress were trying to impede him of governing, especially the problems he was facing to push his electoral agenda uh, in Congress was a reason for him to say that perhaps it was necessary to protect the constitution according to him because the other branches of government were not allowing him to govern. So basically to say that everything was somehow prepared from a rhetorical point of view, but then Bolsonaro used September 7 as the occasion to say perhaps what happened uh, in the US may happen here again because of the dissatisfaction of uh, popular movements of our people with actually Congress and the Supreme Court. And that happened for sure. It didn't happen in 2021. That was his first effort. It didn't happen last year, but now it happened. And I think it was somehow a question of failure of intelligence as well. Journalists had been saying since January 5 last week that it might happen. Friday last week, journalists say, look, these conversations are happening on Telegram and WhatsApp. And it seems that's something that uh, have been strongly discussed here because that's not perhaps the time to find problems in Lula's government, which has just started governing, but perhaps it was uh, necessary to take more seriously these dangers. So to finish, perhaps we were expecting something along these lines should happen rather uh, in December or in January. And why? Because uh, when we have a procedure in Brazil by which the Supreme Electoral Court, we have a Supreme Electoral Court, which is responsible for overseeing the electoral process. And this court has a very, um, I would say mostly symbolic, a uh, ceremony in which it confirms that the president and the vice president were actually elected. It was by around mid-December, and it is day far-right uh, rioters actually used the occasion to try to, for example, invade the headquarters of the military police, the federal police in Brazil. The, tried and they say they might explode gas cylinders uh, in Brazil as well. They actually put fire in a police station. And in general, so we, we might foresee somehow what might happen in the future this day. On December 24, just one day before Christmas, which is a very important date in Brazil, what happened was that actually someone tried to, um, yeah, plot a terrorist attack very close to the airport, the international airport in Brasilia. And the police quickly started the investigation and found out that actually it was due to, or most participants of this possible 
uh, plot, we're living in a camp in front of the headquarters of the military of the army in Brasilia, and that it might be necessary to evacuate to dissolve this camp, but it didn't happen. Still under Bolsonaro's government. So the very last week of the year, we were expecting this to happen perhaps on January 1st, but the security plan was extremely careful precisely because Lula was in danger. And then exactly one week later, it happened. So I will stop here, but mostly from a more long-term point of view, what happened was, as I said, that we might see this somehow happening. Bolsonaro refuses to concede his elections for almost three days. It's somehow indicated for many far-right uh, movements and groups that he didn't recognize Lula as the new president of Brazil. And then the first day after the elections, meaning October 31, Halloween, so for us, uh, perhaps symptomatic, uh, they started to either block roads around Brazil or to create these camps, usually in front of the barracks or headquarters of the military uh, to ask the military to start a coup d'etat. And that's precisely perhaps because of this, uh, the ways in which these movements were taking shape and the ways in which they were already taking shape on, for example, groups that are very difficult to, to investigate on WhatsApp and Telegram that everything seemed to be happened one, two, three, or two months later, if we take seriously the fact that it started on October 31. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the military coups are, you know, the insurrections, um, you know, they, they have been taking place uh, throughout history, right, going back to centuries. Uh, so that's not necessarily uh, unprecedented. Uh, the, I think, you know, what has been recognized as unprecedented is that uh, these far-right insurrections and attempts, attempt at military coups, or the uh, prov you know the calls for a military coup, have been made possible in a rather lightning manner, you know, uh, because of the unprecedented um, uh, information technology, like uh, different social media platforms and different applications, right? Um, the, there have been uh, parallels drawn between, um, you know, what happened on January 6th, you know, after Biden was sworn in, um, you know, in the, in the, or like, uh, I suppose like uh, that was uh, before uh, Biden's uh, swearing in, right? Uh, in, in the United States, in Washington, D.C., uh, the storming of the, of the Capitol building um, where Congress is housed. Can you, Talk about something different other than what has been widely discussed, you know, like the, the use of social media platforms to spread the lies. But, you know, these coups and insurrections take place within certain economic, cultural, ideological or, uh, climate or conditions, right? What are the conditions that had a brought in a very openly far-right, anti-environment, uh, anti-woman, anti-indigenous people, uh, you know, type of um, regime of Bolsonaro, right? Uh, what, what are the conditions, uh, you know? In other words, why are the conditions so conducive to this popular insurrection? Thank you for the question. So that's a very big one, let me try. So I do think that we might, or we should not ignore the economic conditions that make it possible. And I would say not only the West, but in places like Brazil as well, uh, to make people think that far right governments can ensure uh, social and economic rights in a better way in comparison to left-wing movements, which is a fascinating uh, trend, right? So the very basic idea that perhaps governments or left-wing movements 
uh, or left-wing parties or left-wing uh, presidents tend to take economic decisions like which tend to, for example, to maximize inflation and so on and so forth in ways in which actually those who tend to be punished are precisely the poorest. So I think that's a specific trend. I'm not a political economist, but I'd say that there is a lot of work that shows, for example, the ways in which many people, especially white men, for example, in the US, have tended to vote more for Trump or for the Republican Party because they felt that they tended to protect them better against, for example, uh, Chinese products and the ways in which it has been, they, these products, these commodities have been changing um, the American economy. So these are a few trends that we might talk about, for example, inflation, these perceptions of insecurity vis-a-vis -vis importation and so on and so forth. I think it prepares the ground for these kinds of things. Um, I think in Brazil and many places as well, I would say even the US, there is also this more, these two types of liberalism, right? So you have the defense of economic liberalism that the left wing movements and parties are not defending according to these people. And you have the fact that for many people, society has become too liberal from the point of view of customs. And then you have all discussions here in Brazil about the fact that women, LGBTQ movements and um, indigenous peoples. Sorry, go ahead. In, indigenous peoples and their rights, and you know, like in Brazil, like you know, the protection of the Amazon and the uh, uh, the, the the indigenous people who essentially um, you know uh, belong there, right? Um, that has been a major issue, right? I, I mean, like Brazil is a very important country, not only. Uh, from a pers political economic perspective, but from an ecological perspective, you know, like, you know, the Amazons are considered the, you know, important lungs of our ecological system, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the destruction of Amazon uh, is, is closely associated with and triggered by or accelerated by the far right um, uh, ideologies and 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 uh, uh, you know, the regimes like Bolsonaro. So. No, that's true. Yeah, just to I mean, as I was saying, there is this perception that all these movements, including the indigenous, oh, let me just stop and come back, uh, including indigenous movements, they have been too influential uh, in the public sphere in Brazil. That's one perception. Concerning customs, for example, women and the LGBTQ movements would be, for example, influencing our children in very problematic ways, teaching them to have sex, for example, before the moment in which children should have sex and so on and so forth. Great. This is one perspective. So there's this perception of social movements taking too much space in the public sphere, as I have just said, but also when it comes to certain movements, as you said as well, like environmental movements, there is this perception that these movements, including indigenous people fighting for the land in the Amazon forest, for example, they are actually agents fighting against progress. All this environmental discourse, according to them, and sometimes they use a very neo-colonial um, rhetoric to say, look, Europe destroyed their forests. Now they are trying to say to us what we should be doing with our forests as well. So from this point of view, indigenous movements have started to become an economic problem as well, because they impede Brazil and especially far right movements. But in any case, we should be saying that it was happening before. So it became worse during uh, um, Bolsonaro's administration, but it was happening before. We should say in any case that it's a problem in general for Brazil to make it possible or impossible for these people to use the forest illegally. And we start to have a very new series of phenomena in Brazil, like a few years ago here in Sao Paulo, which is very far away from the Amazon rainforest, we could see, for example, the effects of uh, the fires uh, in the forest. So uh, the fact, for example, that um, the sky 
was actually very red in very specific moments of the day. And it was an influence, for example, of all this environmental damage to the forest around Brazil. But just to say that in general, social movements start to become a problem as well. For sure, what's fascinating, at least it's sad, but fascinating for people like me who work on social movements to, to see the ways in which it's the same process by which these movements start to realize that they may have to, or they might have, or they should be resorting to the same tactics and strategies that until now they say were characteristic of the left. Sabotage, the destruction of property, occupying and invading public buildings, and so on and so forth. That's the moment in which we start to see not only far-right movements, but also movements that tend to claim they are social movements as left-wing movements have been uh, in our imaginary. They go to the street, they block the streets, they block roads and so on. And at the same time, they are there because they think that other social movements are very problematic. So I think these are a few of the conditions to answer your question more incisively uh, that made it possible. For sure, there are many other conditions, but I think that there is this perception that's very, very gross of all of us academics like to say, but I would say that there's this perception that the society is not liberal enough from a political, from an economic point of view, and that's too liberal from a pol uh, political and social point of view. Yeah, so the, <clears throat> you know, you use the term um, in our exchange earlier in emails, um, Bolsonarism, uh, you know, in in the U.S., we have this, uh, you know, Trumpism, right? A MAGA, make America again, right? And then in the U U.K. in the 1980s, you've got Thatcherism, right? Uh, Reaganism, you know. And can you, and you know, as a philosopher in history of political thought, uh, can you see certain common threats that run through, you know, these very different, um, you know, political systems and uh, geographic, uh, you know, locations where the, you know, various shades of right wing and uh, ultra right wing, right? Uh, uh, the regimes have captured a significant, uh, you know, segment of their respective societies. Say, for instance, like, you know, uh, okay, like Lula, won the elections fairly, but uh, it was really a, a very close election, a very close, a narrow victory, right? Uh, because the, because the, it was, uh, the, the race was so tight that uh, you needed to have a runoff election between the two top candidates, right, in, in, in your case. But the United States doesn't have that runoff system at the presidential level. So, but still, uh, Donald Trump, gained uh, 70 million um, uh, votes, you know, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, popular votes. That's actually quite a, a significant, uh, you know, a volume of support coming from within the American society, right? And Thatcher was uh, elected uh, or like kept in power for, I think, like two, you know, more than um, the two terms. And then she was forced out uh, during her third term, I believe. And so th there is this, you know, the popular backing of, you know, these ideas that you very uh, brilliantly uh, unpacked. What are the threats that run through these, you know, uh, right-wing regimes of various strengths? That's a great question. So that has been the, the most challenging conversation I have been having the past years, but I will try. So, um, I have been working on the history of political concepts. And some of my mentors probably watching now, they know that one of the things that I have been asking myself is what makes uh, the name of someone, usually the family, the family name, but in Brazil, it usually happens with first names because of the ways in which we use names here. Uh, when the name of someone becomes a political concept. So you have given now- Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro, right. Thatcher, 
and so on. We don't talk about Biden as a political concept in the ways in which you talk about Lulismo in Brazil, Lulism, or we don't talk about Dilma as a political concept. We talk about Bolsonaro as Bolsonarism. We talk about Thatcher, Thatcherism and so on and so forth. So this has been from, uh, from the point of view of a scholar, something that interests me. What are the conditions, political, social conditions that make uh, some people be recognized as someone proposing a very specific ideology that would deserve to be called by, name, by for example, Bolsonarism and so on and so forth. I think there are very common, a, a series of very common threads among all these movements. For example, I do have the impression that for example, this, this idea of criticizing how society is too liberal is very common. Um, but I would say that in Brazil, we don't have some characteristics that are very strong in the case of Europe and the US comparatively. And I'm saying that by reading the work of people who know about that better than me, but I would say that, for example, this idea of creating this external enemy that usually is uh, the refugee the immigrants and so on and so forth. For, for sure, this exists in Brazil among far-right extremists. For many people, it's even a uh, kind of uh, repetition of the same term to say far-right extremists, but let's say people who are more extremists in the political spectrum of the far-right in Brazil, they may actually be against refugees, immigrants, and so on and so forth. We did have, not like Europe, but we did have um, uh, wave of refugees in the past decade, but it doesn't exist so strongly in Brazil. Another thing I would say is usually what characterizes our specific type of um, far-right movements is the ways in which militarism and the militarization of society do play a key role in the ways in which they give shape to their solutions to the problems they identify. I don't see this happening, for example, in the US and in Europe as strong as in Brazil. This perception that we need to come back to the dictatorship years. So just to clarify for those of us who were not Brazilian, Brazilians, so that we, we had an anti-communist coup d'etat in 64, and this anti-communist coup d'etat is at least in most um, mainstream narratives radicalized in 68, when there is a new decree that basically overloads the constitution and then the redemocratization process starts in 85. So basically 21 years of dictatorship and we have a new constitution in 88. And many of you perhaps saw people brandishing, brandishing uh, a copy of the constitution in front of the Supreme Court one week ago. So this idea that a new military coup would be necessary is very strong in our far right extremism. And I would say that one of the main characteristics of Bolsonarism in comparison to Trump, Trumpism, for example, so I think we might go on and on, but I do think, and I do have the impression, and I think many people have been trying to do this this week, especially Brazilian scholars, to say, look, we are not only seeing a repetition of Marine Le Pen and Orban and so on and so forth in Brazil and Trump in Brazil of the January 6th insurrections, because we do tend to do so. Okay, now we were expecting that we would copy the US one more time, for sure. I think it's not productive to ignore the strands, but at the same time, I think it's important to realize that we're not talking about this, uh, the ways in which there, there are actually importation of ideas simply, but the ways in which these people, these far right movements, especially Bolsonaro's oldest son, Eduardo Bolsonaro, who almost actually became uh, the ambassador of Brazil in the US, they are part of far right networks. So Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo, he's all the time in the US participating in events, Congress, 
collaborating with Steve Bannon and so on and so forth. So instead of thinking about copying or not, I think it's more useful for us to think, and now that's perhaps a provocation, that these movements have been more successful than left-wing movements in creating international networks of solidarity, of exchanging of experiences that make it possible for them to, at the same time, see what might happen in a specific context that didn't work in other contexts and vice versa. So I think the main trend that I would identify is to see or to understand, perhaps I'm exaggerating this feature of Bolsonarism, but I do think that we might not ignore how militarism does play a key role in Bolsonarism as a solution for all problems. He created, just to give an example, I'm talking too much, but just to give an example, he created multiple um, military schools around Brazil, which now Lula is trying to reconfigure or close. But the main idea was we need a military education. We need more militaries and uh, members of the military in power. And many of these people were people who were responsible for the, uh, the missions uh, of the UN in Haiti. So we see this process of militarization of society, which is very strong. At the same time, I think another feature is how important it became for Bolsonaro in comparison to previous leaders to forge these international solidarities with all the far right movements. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting you talk about the international solidarity among the far right or proto fascist uh, movements and regimes, because I was just reading a meme uh, attributed to Alexander uh, Solzhenitsyn, who said, uh, you know, uh, the, the strength of evil people is that they collaborate and they offer solidarity to each other. You know? uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, like when you talk about progressive movements and the left, left-wing movements around the world, uh, the, often these movements uh, get fractured uh, through uh, different, you know, intellectual di or ideological disagreements within the, the progressive framework, right? Whereas, in fact, you've got, um, you know, far-right movements across the world uh, lending each other a helping hand uh, from, you know, Russia's uh, Putin is known to be close to, say, Marie Le Pen of France, you know, and then uh, Victor Orban of Hungary is close to, uh, Trump and Republican Party and Trump advisors or former advisors, right? Uh, the, what, what's interesting is that you talk about the, uh, the, the first uh, coup in Brazil in 1964 against the communist uh, threat or communist government. You know, I, I was born in 1963. So you could say I was born into the age of uh, uh, military coups. Uh, you know, the, if you look at Indonesia, 1965, uh, Burma coup, 1962, and then you've got, um, you know, militarization and, uh, art, you know, promotion of a uh, ultra conservative interpretation of Islam in Egypt and across Middle East, right, against, uh, uh, you know, the, the governments and politicians and even military leaders with uh, uh, the socialistic egalitarian perspective. And the, uh, ironically, um, the these coups were almost invariably backed by liberal democracies. You know, like particularly the United States, and to a lesser extent, the United Kingdom. Right by then, UK didn't really matter in the world stage after having lost the empire. Right? And so, US emerged as the number one power from the liberal capitalist democracy bloc. And then you've got the Soviet Union and China, right? And so the militarism was supported, right? Uh, militarism or military coups uh, around the world was supported by the United States and liberal democracies. Now, like, you know, the, 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 the very liberal democracies have come, come under the, the similar threats, right? I mean, like in... It, as you know well, uh, but you you've also uh, you know uh, written quite a lot on Burma or discussed a lot on Myanmar, uh, my own uh, native country, and the the around the time of the February first, twenty twenty uh, twenty twenty one coup in Myanmar, there were some um, you know Trump supporters, very prominent ones, you know, including 
uh, senior, former senior officials from the Trump administration, they were saying that United States needed a Burma-style military coup, right? This, this is considered like one of the most vibrant uh, and, uh, you know, uh, oldest uh, democracies in the world. And in the middle of Washington, D.C., you've got this narrative emerging among uh, Trump supporters that USA needs a military coup like Myanmar, right? And so um, that that's just a side comment. And then the, uh, the, the, the one other issue that I want you to, uh, to touch on is, um, um, you, you know, across your borders, um, you know, you, you, you have had um, rather unstable political scenarios uh, where the elected, um, uh, you know, governments have been overthrown or threatened. You know, with or without the American support, like Venezuela, for instance, right? Um, Hugo Chavez was never uh, at ease in power because although he was widely popular at home uh, for his like socialistic economic policies, uh, but he was seen as a threat to capitalist world order in you know in an oil rich country of Venezuela. And now you currently have a uh, Peru, right? Um, the, where there have been like a major protest, um, you know, by the um, supporters of the ousted uh, president Castel, Castillo or Castillo, and mm -hmm. can you can you touch on, you know, the other Latin American, you know, political cases where there is this clash between the established money classed capitalist order and the you know the the populist or populist not necessarily right wing but uh, rural based uh, protest movement in other words is there an a, a urban rural money or the haves and haves not conflict uh, involved uh, beyond you know the conservatism as an ideology Terrific. So let me try. I would like just to start with uh, a point I forgot to make when we were saying about how close the election was, right? When we were discussing certain political concepts such as Lulism, Bolsonarism, and so on. I think for sure we might not, we should not ignore the fact that the election was extremely close. But what it seems, I mean, it seems to be the case, I think. I'm not sure whether it would be even controversial to say that we have at least 33, 35% of the population who usually tends to agree with Bolsonaro over everything. Beyond the 35, let's say, many people seem to vote not because that's Bolsonaro, but because they are voting against Lula and because they have the impression that Lula's administration and then Dilma's won, so Lula, Dilma got also a very close election when she was re-elected, and then she suffered the coup d'etat. Uh, sorry, the coup d'etat. That's another discussion we might have. Uh, that's a discussion we have in Brazil about whether it was a kind of uh, institutional coup d'etat or not, but she suffered impeachment, so she was impeached, um, and so she basically just stayed one and a half terms in government. So many people tend to associate both administrations with corruption because of many corruption scandals that actually happened during the both administrations. And many of these people who voted probably in favor of Bolsonaro were perhaps against many of Bolsonaro's policies and ideological positions. But they thought that having Lula, Dilma, and the Workers' Party yeah, in power again would be very dangerous for Brazil. That's one of the things we might not ignore. So great. Now, to come back to your point, so I'd like also to say about this kind of far-right internationalism I was describing, that it has been very clear and say more and more yeah i mean now we can see much easier especially when bolsonaro refused to show clear support to these movements that started october 31 
that there are many uh, fractures inside these movements. Uh, the question is how coherent they will stay, especially for us in comparison to more progressive movements. So it seems that many, 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 many leaders, uh, far right leaders, are now criticizing Bolsonaro because he was too weak, because he didn't stay in Brazil, because he's now in the US, and so on and so forth. By the way, perhaps you have realized many of you that our one of the responsible for what happened in Sunday, Sunday on, in Brazil has just arrived in Brazil and he's actually basically talking with the police before going to jail, which or who was actually the secretary or the, the minister of security of Bolsonaro. And now he was actually the secretary of security of the state of the federal district. And he is basically in jail because He's being investigated for being largely responsible for the fact that the police didn't respond uh, quick, fast to what happened. Great. That being said, now to come back to your question, sorry, Dr. Zorini. So to come back to your question about the Latin American con uh, context, I do think that sometimes using the category of populism may make us forget the fact that we are talking about very different kinds of policies. And that perhaps the fact that these policies and ideological positions tend to say that the people should play a key role in political life. So these positions are sometimes so different that perhaps it's not useful for us to use the category of populism. But for sure, that's in, to think about Latin America that usually the category was used in the past and being used today. I do think that perhaps many of you know that Lula has been strongly criticized because he doesn't have a strong position against more authoritarian forms of regime by left-wing leaders in Latin America. Uh, I do think at the same time, and I think that's they, that may be a provocation for many, that in general, across the political spectrum, we do tend to say, that to protect certain political values, we should resort to exceptional means. And I even remember when, for example, Dilma Rousseff uh, was impeached, of many people saying that exceptional means were necessary to protect our democracy. Now we are having the same discussions again. Now we are having the discussions about the fact that perhaps the investigations about what happened last week and the past two years are being, they are not respecting due process, for example. They are not protecting, uh, respecting constitutional protect, uh, sorry, the constitutional liberties of those who are involved and so on and so forth. And there is this very strong idea that comes back to Karl Lovenstein, who was, was a German theorist who had to uh, find exile in, the US and who proposed that democracy should be more militant against people who are against the very democracies and democratic values democracy should protect and that we might suspend uh, the fundamental rights of the people in question. Just to say that there are this perception that in situations of exceptionality, we should not take democratic procedures so seriously. And I do have the impression that this very rhetoric has been used by left-wing uh, movements and parties in Latin America to justify, for example, what happened in Peru, especially to say that we might or we should use these exceptional measures to protect ourselves against new forms of colonialism, especially US colonialism in places like Venezuela and all places where there are primary goods like oil that are of interest yeah, for the United States. So you'd say that in general, the question about coup attempts, more authoritarian forms of regime around Latin America tends to concern always these dynamics, these hemispheric di dimensions that make usually the US be interested in Latin America. That's perhaps reductive to say so. For sure that Europe and other countries have interest in what's happening in Latin America as well, but the US has always had this very specific interest 
in the political uh, order in Latin America, their neighbor, as many say, and the ways in which sometimes for basic economic uh, reasons, it's necessary for the US to intervene, either to support uh, authoritarian governments or to forge authoritarian governments. I would say that if now when we are talking for those who are not familiar about Peru, we are talking about a left-wing leader who tried basically choose to, yeah, it was a coup attempt, right? So he was, he is being investigated in a corruption scandal. And then we have to compare, just to say, another example of Bolivia in the past few years in which we didn't see the same dynamics. So we had a left-wing leader in power and we had a movement that actually basically tried to oust leader in power and to create a new government. And for many, it was considered to be a coup d'etat as well. Great, so in general, you can imagine how perceptions of paranoia are strong uh, in Latin America when these things happen because of our past relationship with the US government when it comes to coup d'etats, to regime change in other countries. So many people do think, and perhaps they are right, and perhaps we are going to discover that very quickly, that the US is trying to play a key role again one more time in what has been happening in places like Chile, Brazil, Venezuela for sure, Bolivia and Peru. Yes. But the dynamics is always about putting some, it tends to be about putting a right-wing movement in power. For many people, the difference now is that it seems that the US was trying to put Lula in power again. And then we might discuss why in this case. <laughs> Right. Yeah, because a number of years ago, I was running this uh, genocide podcast series, and uh, one of my uh, very distinguished uh, guests was uh, Professor Daniel Fierstein uh, from uh, the University of Buenos Aires, uh, you know, the Argentine um, National University. And he was, uh, you know, the, giving a broad stroke perspective of how the United States uh, promoted uh, what it what is known then as national security doctrine. The United States was uh, you know, uh, actively involved in shaping the, uh, the nature or the contours and ideological orientation of a different Latin American states, right? Uh, the, in, in the thick of the uh, Cold War. And so, you know, communist and indigenous rights, uh, progressive movements, workers' unions, they were all seen as a threat to national security, or they been they were framed, and so you know that's how you know the the the, um, uh, the other nine eleven took place in in Chile. You know, the Pinochet uh, was uh, uh, put on the throne by the CIA. Everybody knew this, and and you know Brazil and other places. But the um, now that the Cold War is you know over. You know, this ideological struggle between capitalism and another system, the communist uh, command economy, uh, is, is, is pretty much, you know, done. Because every single state in the world has embraced, um, you know, some form of, um, you know, semi-free uh, market economy, because of all the economies... Uh, integrated into a single world economy as opposed to two major world economic systems, you know, as, as it existed um, uh, before the collapse of um, the Soviet Union, right? And, uh, you know, even China, the leading communist state, uh, is, is, is a full throttle uh, state capitalist state uh, as opposed to, you know, all communist, uh, you know, a command economy. And so, so why is the United States and other powers interested in influencing the political processes within your region, you know, the, the, the um, uh, Latin and Central Americas? Well, what, what, what are their main economic or geopolitical interests in that region that 
undoubtedly have um, you know, uh, uh, impact on the domestic or national political institutions and politi- you know, the political climate. Why, why, why are why are these you know uh, external powers involved in Latin America, Central America? Terrific question. So this one, I I will be careful because that's not a topic I would say I'm very competent to talk about. But there are many reasons. I would say that one of the reasons, especially as we have discussed before, um, primary goods that are important for the US, oil mainly. And we do, we do know very- You say iron. Yes. And I would say, for example, now, now that's something again that we need more investigation about. So uh, we didn't talk yet about the so-called Lava Jato operation, which was this corruption investigation in Brazil that mainly that was responsible, I would say, for many of the things that happened in the past decade, since June 2013, and including responsible for Dumas impeachment. We can talk about that more later, if you wish. But the question is that some leaked documents by WikiLeaks that we can find on WikiLeaks show that it was, was offering what they call kind of workshops to uh, judges in Brazil, especially the judge that put Lula in jail, then became Bolsonaro's attorney general, then accused Bolsonaro of corruption, and now supported Bolsonaro again, and now became a senator. So his name is uh, Moro, Sergio Moro, which became very well known, received many prizes around the world. Let me come back. Here is... uh, he received many prizes for his anti-corruption stances and investigations, and he participated in the US uh, in workshops against corruption in Latin America, but also workshops in which uh, questions pertaining to the war on drugs and the, and the ways in which drugs arrive from Latin America in the US. And it seems to be a, a different preoccupation uh, concerning, yeah, that marks this relationship between US, the US, and places like Brazil. So we are talking about security, we are talking sometimes about immigrant and refugees uh, waves arriving in the US, like the so-called refugee crisis, the immigration crisis. We are talking about certain commodities, so, uh, um, certain primary goods. And I think uh, this, all this preoccupations together characterize somehow the US foreign policy vis-a-vis Latin America today. Uh, Not only South America in this case, but Latin America more broadly, thinking about Mexico and so on and so forth. So we are talking, we are thinking always about the war on drugs, sometimes even about the war on terror, but we are also thinking about more economic interests in the region that sometimes left-wing movements uh, represent a problem for the US from this point of view. The ways in which the US cannot, yeah, create economic relationships with the countries in question because of the ways in which these countries tend to sometimes don't give advantage perhaps to the US market and international competition. I see. So uh, there's an issue of um, the the economic freedom, which is the uh, freedom to exploit anything that is of value, whether it's uh, you know minerals uh, you know below the ground, or the um, you know the primary rainforests, or you know uh, other other uh, <clears throat> or access to like a you know like a, the, uh, the clean water you know because uh, w- water is no you know not just an essential um, essential uh, item for human survival, but it's it's a highly lucrative uh, commodity, right? And you know that's why we we see like a, you know bottling um, the multinational corporations with the billions and billions of dollars in capital moving into uh, you know different regions of the world and um, sealing off certain areas for uh, clean water, which they you know uh, bottle and sell, right? And the, the, uh, the while I mean, the, you know water has become a bit you know. Um, in the same league, 
uh, with oil and gas, right? It's, it's no longer essential goods, but they're extremely lucrative items. Then sure. I, think, I think like Peru, for instance, I, you know, from little I know about your region, uh, Peru is, um, has one of the largest deposits of copper, right? And then now like we've got uh, rare earth minerals, and, you know, all things um, um, you know, that are so crucial for uh, building a, um, a green economy, right? And that they, they, you've got to, you, you still have to get rare earths like you know, the, 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 like a lithium and things like that to, to create the electronically run uh, vehicles and you know like telephones and whatnot, right? Um, so the, the, the one final question I want to ask is the, uh, you know, Brazil is an extremely diverse um, country in terms of uh, you know the the origins of the people, the migration, right? Uh, then you've got um, a, a very strong uh, presence of indigenous people uh, that, that were there before the arrival of the, uh, the Spaniards and, you know, the Portuguese and others, right? Uh, the French as well, uh, the whole area. And, um, and you have a very fascinating concept of uh, uh, identity, race, for instance, right? Are there like, uh, um, you know, quote unquote, racial divide or elements, you know, that drive uh, different types of um, ideological movements, whether it's a leftist, progressive, uh, you know, justice-oriented, uh, egalitarian, uh, you know, uh, movement, or whether it's like, you know, uh, the, the defend the, you know, the European civilization, defend the status quo of the white man, uh, you know, uh, and the, uh, the, the defend the economic uh, rights, uh, economic freedom uh, to make money out of anything, right? So are, are there elements of such nature, you know, nature, okay. you know, racial, for instance, you know, in, uh, behind okay. these ideological conflicts? Well, thank you very much for this question, because I do think uh, that that's a feature of what has been happening. I would say a feature of Bolsonarism that we try to ignore, and I would say something that has been largely ignored in the work of pundits and political commentators this week. That has been wonderful to read. The I mean, the quality of what has been published about Bolsonarism in Brazil is wonderful. Uh, I'm not criticizing my colleagues from this point of view. I would just like to say how conceptions of white supremacism do play a key role in Bolsonarism. For sure, I, I may imagine even people listening to us, watching us now can say, look, we do know that many black people in Brazil support Bolsonaro. And you can easily find on Facebook, for example, a groups of people like black people for Bolsonaro, LGBT people for Bolsonaro and so on and so forth. But the fact is that even for these people, many, I mean, just to insist again, because I know that many people can consider that a, a kind of provocation. Uh, I know that many leaders, far right leaders who support Bolsonaro are black as well. But it's clear that Bolsonaro is mainly supporting white supremacist ideologies. When it comes to indigenous people, as we discussed before, it's very strong, the perception that they are lazy and they are just occupying lands that might be otherwise productive lands. And we are talking not only about Amazon rainforest. So it's part of the process by which Bolsonaro's administration would like to use the forest more for, for example, yeah, any, not any kind, but for many economic means like mineration, uh, deforestation, the production of wood, and so on and so forth. So there is this perception that uh, the, the, the indigenous peoples in Brazil are a problem. The native people in Brazil, I'd say, that's perhaps the best term. Today we talk about povos originarios, and perhaps many of you realize that now we have, for the first time in history, a ministry just for the originary people. That being said, about Black movements in Brazil, as I was saying as well, these movements have been taking shape exactly. I mean, we have a long story of Black resistance in Brazil. 
since enslavement and independence and the abolition of slavery were marked by this so-called slave revolts. But movements, especially among students, have been taking shape in a very strong fashion in the past decade, uh, mainly inside universities, but outside universities as well. We have been publishing more and more about how ideological this conception of racial unity is in Brazil. How the fact that Black people are the majority of the population, but at the same time, they are not represented in space of power. How even in Lula's government, the representation of Black people has not been enough from this point of view. So we have this myth of ideological, sorry, of racial unity, which is not true. Most people who die in the hands of the police are Black. And we are not a minority of the population, 13% like in the West. We are actually almost 45 uh, or 52. If, it depends of who you consider to be Black, for sure, another big discussion now in Brazil. But the main question here, to answer to your question more incisively, is the fact that Bolsonaro plays on these racial divisions without always using racial rhetoric in an explicit way. For example, by saying that the question is not the indigenous people are indigenous people, but the fact that they are actually uh, lazy. The problem is not that black people are black. The problem is not their skin color. The problem is that many black people tend to be criminals. So you use this apparently racial blind rhetoric to talk about, uh, I cannot even say minority groups when it comes to black people, but to justify the more white supremacy dimensions. But for sure, I don't want to say that he is not openly uh, a white supremacist because he does say many racist things against black people, indigenous people, and so on. But usually he uses all this rhetoric that passes by laziness, criminality, and so on and so forth, which is extremely close to the kind of the, uh, I'd not even say far right, but right wing rhetoric in the US all this war on crime and war on drugs rhetoric that takes shape since the 70s and even before since the 60s, if you wish, is very strong in Brazil as well. We have TV channels showing all the day Black people going to jail, or being incarcerated, paying for the crimes, and Bolsonaro plays with that, especially because his government was marked by this conception of public security and public safety that for many people, again, that vote for Bolsonaro is their main preoccupation. Right. That the yeah. left-wing movements are, not, are too liberal with criminals. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I, I think the, you know, what, what's fascinating to me is the, uh, you know, this historical threat ideologically, um, you know, which establishes, uh, you know, pseudo-scientifically this, um, uh, you know, biological basis for social behavior. Right, laziness uh, is associated with the lower classes, or you know, like a, a non-white skin color, right? Or woman, you know, unproductivity, that kind of thing, right? And it, it goes all the way to Nazism, and you know, the the Jewish people were portrayed as a sense, you know, there's a specific crime registry, just uh, you know, uh, just to indicate, uh, you know, the, from Nazi perspective. How criminally prone Jewish people are, that kind of thing, right? Like a meticulously recorded uh, petty crimes uh, committed by you know, Jewish people, like petty crimes committed universally by anybody. But it, it has nothing to do with race or faith. But it did, you know, but the, the Nazis made it a special category, right? And and and, and you talk about the, um, the the you know mass incarceration of like uh, uh, non-white people. In the United States, it's you know the largest like you know the prison industry in the world uh, is in the U.S. or like you know particularly among the industrialized nations, right? And uh, the, the 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 overwhelmingly disproportionate number of inmates you know uh, locked up in U.S. prisons, both pr publicly funded and private you know industry uh, managed prisons, are people of color, right? And then so, but, but they don't, they would not say that we, you know, I mean, like racial profiling happens in the U.S., you know, in, in all like, you know, uh, the white dominant, um, you know, uh, the societies of the West, right? And uh, the police would always like, 
you know, found to be, uh, you know, the profiling, you know, drivers based on the on basically skin color, right? And so, so I think like what I notice is like you know, the, the and I feel a bit confirmed to hear uh, from your own analysis is that uh, the, the r- r- racial elements are never sufficiently confronted in the uh, analyses around Brazil, right? uh, because uh, Brazil is seen as a very special, you know, a, a very uh, the racially integrated society. And then, as you said, you've got to look at the positions of power, who occupied them. You know, you go to Mexico, similar, right? You know what I mean? And um, the, you look at the phone books and you see the... Uh, the names of European, you know, mostly Spaniards, and then you associate, you know, you link their names to their economic and political power, and it emerges uh, that uh, there is a, this is a pattern, not a, you know, random thing, right? So, um, finally, um, where do you think the Brazilian, um, you know, the democracy is heading? Because, like, you know, even if you put like a 2,000, 3,000 people behind bars and try them, like uh, the, you know the, what uh, the, the Lula government's doing or Biden government's doing in the U.S., right? Uh, the uh, January 6 insurrectionists have, have been jailed, sent to uh, you know uh, sentenced to, to uh, the various um, you know jail time, but apparently the societies um, you know. A significant chunk of the Brazilian and the United States societies have embraced this, you know, Bolsonarism and Trumpism. You know, Trump may not be elected again, but the ideas that he have has come to personify, right, uh, or the Bolsonaro may not be back in power, but the ideas that have been unleashed, you know, through his presidency. And uh, after the defeat, they are not going to go away. You see what I mean? So where 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 do you think your uh, country is uh, heading in terms of its ideological orientation? It. Yeah, my fear to answer very incisively to your question. My fear is that sooner or later, and probably very soon, uh, another figure, character, is going to replace Bolsonaro and the far-right imagination in Brazil. Because they are, as I said, very disappointed with Bolsonaro. There is this perception that he could have staged a coup. There is this perception that he could have used his term in office to be more draconian about many things. And he insisted at the same time multiple, on multiple occasions that he needed the help of the people. So his last speech before flying to the US was precisely along these lines to say, look, one cannot, uh, I mean, he doesn't say explicitly, for example, stage a coup or start an authoritarian form of government. We cannot do so without support of the military and of the people, of a considerable part of the people. And that was the problem. But what's interesting, and that's something that I have been thinking about since last week, we have been having polls about the perception of Brazilian people concerning what happened Sunday. And these polls show that more or less 93% of the population were against the insurrection, which basically shows that most people who voted for Bolsonaro in October they were against what happened. Perhaps I would say because it contradicts both those who voted for Lula, for Lula's perception, I mean, those who voted for Lula, they had a perception that was wrong. Many of those who voted for Bolsonaro precisely because of questions around public safety and security did find it too problematic as well. But the question is that not everyone was happy with the scoop attempt, which was, to be quite honest, I don't think uh, it's fair to say that it's a coup or a coup attempt in the ways in which we have been seeing coups in Africa, in places like Burma in the past few years. But for in the imaginary, in the political imagination of these people, they were actually starting a coup d'etat, perhaps making it possible for Bolsonaro to come back as an authoritarian leader in Brazil. That's for sure. But 
mm, to come back to your question, I think there is this perception that political violence is wrong. And now what we should discover, especially as political scientists, is what's the perception about how wrong authoritarian forms of government are across the political spectrum? I think answering this question is the most important question for us now. Yeah. Well, um, I think we are on the uh, one hour, 15 minutes mark. And so we've been talking for 75 minutes. And so um, uh, you've been listening to um, the, uh, the political philosopher and historian of political thought, Ureldo. Uh, from Brazil. Um, he is a PhD candidate at the Pontion Sorbonne University, uh, one of the oldest in, in the world, uh, in uh, Paris. And uh, um, uh, Uraldo, um, uh, thank you so very much. And I, I look forward to um, reading your um, essays. And also, um, we will uh, definitely be in touch. Yeah. Thank you so much for, uh, thank you for having spending me. your um, afternoon uh, on this subject. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye.